இருக்கா யூடியூப்ல ஹலோ ஓகே மை கனெக்ஷன் இஸ் பெட்டர் நவ் ஆ ஓகே இங்க வி ஆர் லைவ் ஆன் யூடியூப் ஹலோ டாக்டர் ஜிம்ஷன் சதில் சொல்லுங்க யூ வாண்ட் மீ டு சேஞ்ச் மை பொசிஷன் இஸ் இட் டு டார்க் பேக்ரவுண்ட் அசோக் மேல ஒரு டியூப்லைட்ட போடுங்க அசோக் இல்ல ஆறு டியூப்லைட் போட்டு வச்சிருக்கேன் ஃபால் சீலிங்ல ஐ திங்க் ஐ ஜஸ்ட் चेंज द पोजीशन டாக்டர் ஜிம் ஓ சாரி சொல்லுங்க சார் நீங்க ஓன் இல்லங்க நம்ம ஜஸ்டிஸ் ஷேர் ஸ்கிரீன் போயிட்டு அந்த டைம் वी ஹேவ் டு ஓபன் அப் த பவர் பாயிண்ட் ரைட் ফুল ஸ்கிரீன் ஆமா ஏனா இப்போ ஓபன் பண்ணனோ ஓபன் ஆகல ஐ திங்க் பவர் பாயிண்ட் இஸ் ஓபனிங் பட் நம்ம ஷேர் அதாவது நீங்க பவர் பாயிண்ட் ஓபன் பண்ணிட்டு சார் ஷேர் ஸ்கிரீன் கொடுத்தீங்கனா எல்லாமே அந்த பாப் அப்ல காமிக்க சார் அந்த டேபிள்க்குள்ள என்னென்ன ஸ்லைட்ஸ் இருக்கு ஓபன் பண்ணி வச்சிருக்கீங்க எல்லாமே காமிக்கும் இல்ல இல்ல நம்ம இல்ல அந்த டைம்ல Hi, Ashok. It looks powerful now. Oh. Hello? Ah, Is sure. this better? Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. Look smart. Very good. Oh, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it. Tie and shorts. Tie and shorts. Yes. Jim? It is showing me. Yes, there is too much. ஒருத்தர் <laughs> 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 We've been successfully having the last two sessions over the last two Sundays on middle third fracture and orbital fracture. Today we look forward to a great session on overcoming challenges in mandibular fracture. Over to you Dr. Jimson. Yeah. Now, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, ma'am, for the uh, introduction. Uh, now, it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers of the day. Uh, we have four uh, eminent speakers uh, today discussing about mandible fractures. And to, uh, they'll be discussing about the challenges uh, that they have encountered in dealing with these patients and uh, how to overcome that. And uh, first, we have Dr. Venkata Salapati. Uh, who is the director and head of the department of craniofacial surgery at Anna Joseph Hospital Institute of Dental I mean Neurosciences Madurai he graduated from the prestigious Tamil Nadu Government Dental College 
uh, and uh, he has been associated with uh, Vinayak Mission Dental College uh, and CAC Dental College Madurai as professor. Uh, welcome, Dr. Venkata Salabadi, to the show. And next, uh, we have Dr. Ashok Ramadurai, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery at Thai Mugambi Dental College, Chennai. He has completed his uh, fellowship from the Royal College of Edinburgh and uh, Glasgow, and he is working as a, a, a registrar in uh, England for a few years before he came back to India. Then again, he went to serve in Singapore for four, four or five years, and then again, now he is back coming as at Chennai. Welcome, Dr. Ashok, to the program. Thank you. Uh, Next, we have Dr. Uh, Deepanandan, who is the professor and head of the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery at Sri Ramakrishna Dental College, Coimbatore. He did his uh, MDS from Savita Dental College, Chennai, and he's been associated with uh, Ramakrishna Dental College for uh, almost 12 years now. Welcome, Dr. Deepanandan. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sentil Nathan. Uh, who is a consultant at Apollo Hospital, Chennai, and is also a professor at uh, Savita Dental College. He also graduated from Savita Dental College. Uh, and uh, welcome, Dr. Sandinadal, to the show. Uh, uh, over to Dr. Uh, Ashok. Jim, you want me to start first? I thought it was the other order. Dr. Venkata Salabadi, yeah. Hello. You can you can start sharing your Hello, screen. Jim. Okay, one second. Yeah. Uh, Jim, hello. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jim, tell anything, la. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, shall I start? Yeah. Jim, yeah. I'm. I'm audible. Yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, you're audible. You're, you're audible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good morning, friends. Uh, thank you, Jim, for your kind words of my introduction. I work in a hospital, a tertiary a neurosurgical care a institute of uh, Anna Joseph. Then also uh, Madurai Institute of Orthopedic and Traumatology, Madurai. I work under two legends. One is Dr. M.J. Arun Kumar, sir. The another one is Dr. Mathuvel Rajan. Both of them are legend in their own field like orthopedics and neurosurgery. Today, we are going to discuss a few scenarios while treating a mandibular fractures. To go next. How to minimize this? Yeah. Okay. Today we are going to discuss about mandibular fractures and concomitant injuries. Next. Every time I have to do like this. Huh? No? Yeah. Coming to the radiological evaluation in trauma, our institute, we prefer any patient with a facial fracture, irrespective of glascophoma scar. Screening of chest, brain, and cervical spine, we do. We do we prefer this protocol. We, the people think it may add onto the cost, but we don't know the extent of the impact 
the underlying organ disease which might lead to post operative fever and sepsis the ct will helps in ruling out distant foreign bodies this is the patient a high velocity road traffic accident came with gcs of 8 this patient has got pneumothorax and deep glowing mid face injury she has got a naso orbito ethmoidal fracture and frontal bone fracture and left angle fracture we have received the patient with the tube intubated this is the ct picture shows center mid face injury with left angle of the mandible fracture we think like this will be a simple case where we can go ahead with the fixation of left angle and center mid face reconstruction this patient has got pneumothorax we have put icd you can left side chest x ray shows uh, icd tube inside this is the post operative scenario from day 1 to day 7 the patient has developed hypovolemia with the hypotension you can see the three three infusion pumps three infusion pumps we want to tackle the hypovolemia with the with the use of vasopressin and epinephrine the patient has developed continuous pyrexia initially we thought it is due to lung infection we have changed into a higher antibiotics but nothing works out for this particular patient on the day 8 the patient has gone for hypothermia hypothermia indicates cerebellar dysfunction cerebellar dysfunction what does it mean this patient has got high velocity injury which leads to both internal carotid artery dissection that internal carotid artery dissection has result in cerebellum has gone for necrosis the ct picture what you see is the white cerebellar sign we have lost this patient due to cerebellar necrosis the inference from this patient is whenever you come across high velocity injuries you should do ultrasound of the neck or ct angio neck to rule out any carotid injuries then coming to the cervical spine why we have to take c spine in a fully conscious patient with uh, gcs 15 by 15 the patient is not able to move the limbs these are the three possible causes can result in inability to move the upper limbs one is c spine injury the another one is brachial plexus injury or the patient may have clavicle or humerus fractures this most of the time the c spine injury we we may not be able to identify the initial stage and the brachial plexus injuries also i will show few cases this is the c spine injury with the mandibular fracture this patient has got c4 c5 dislocation which, which result in paralysis of the upper limbs this is the case of mandible fracture we operated this patient has shows the brachial plexus avulsion you can see the mri usually brachial plexus injuries we have to go in for taking mri this mri shows all the roots from c1 c2 c3 all the roots of the brachial plexus has been avulsed this indicates this silent brachial plexus injury in mandibular fractures you should keep in your mind then why we have to take ct chest and abdomen ct and chest abdomen we have to take contrast ct it helps in rule out pneumothorax or hemothorax or hemoperitoneum this ct axial view shows there is a huge collection of blood inside the lungs you can very much appreciate hemothorax in this picture this is like uh, a case of tension pneumothorax followed by facial injury you can see the air shadow inside the lung space 
This is one interesting case which came to our dental OP referred by one of my good friend nearby, some 60 kilometers away from Madurai. I have seen this patient. He met with an accident, a two-wheeler. His GCS is 15 by 15. By clinical examination, the pulse rate is around 260. BP is around 60-40. The respiratory rate is around 40. He is having tachycardia, tachypnea, and hypotension. This patient has got only the angle and parasympathesis fracture. You can very well appreciate the parasympathesis fracture and angle fracture. Why this much of uh, systemic circulatory disturbance? This angle and parasympathesis fracture never produce hypovolemia. We have subject this patient as an emergency. We have taken CT chest and thorax and abdomen to rule out any vascular injury. This patient has got hemoperitoneum, approximately more than a liter of blood is collected in the peritoneal space. He has got grade three splenic injury. How to proceed with this patient? You can see the axial CT, you can see the splenic rupture and collection of blood in the peritoneal cavity. So, Immediately, we have taken up the patient for splenectomy and fixation of facial bone fractures concomitantly. See, why I want to stress this patient? This patient gives a history of injury by the handlebar of the bike to the abdomen. By taking history, you can come to a conclusion there is a blend injury of the abdomen which can result in circulatory collapse. The take home message from this part of the presentation, you have to subject the patient for CT brain, C-spine, chest and abdomen is the must. Whether the patient is fully conscious or not, you should take. Coming to the mandibular fractures and airway compromise. This is the patient uh, reported with a history of road traffic accident. His GCS is 13 by 15. He has got intraoral bleeding. There is sublingual hematoma and elevation of the tongue, also the floor of the mouth. This patient has got enoptolmus. This patient has got compromised airway. How to go with the patient? We have taken CT pneumogram. This is the particular software we have in my scan center. This shows absolute blockage of the nasopharyngeal airway due to posterior displacement of the mandible. You can very much appreciate in the pneumogram there is compromised airway. The left side, the slide, the sagittal section, it shows the tongue falling back and obstructing the airway. This is the preoperative CT. The right side picture is the newer technology in the field of uh, CT. This is called a cinematic rendering. This is the pre-op picture on the left side. On my right top, you can see there is an orbital floor fracture. There is a hemocyanus in the maxilla. You can see the displacement of the mandible. The axial section shows the lingual splaying, the tongue falling back and obstructing the airway. These are the few advantages of taking 3D CT. You can educate the patient. You can find the magnitude of the fracture displacement, the, how the fracture is being displaced which helps it, it helps in reduction. It helps in implant selection. How means it, what type of implant, what system of implant we are going to use. It helps in post-operative assessment by taking one more CT. This is the cinematic rendering technology, CT source. There is a parasympathesis left, parasympathesis fracture. 
with a right angle fracture he has got right leaf root 3 fracture and uh, frontonasal disjunction also uh, right orbital blow root fracture also this patient has got this is another view how the mandible is being displaced posteriorly this is the cinematic rendering technology of the orbit and frontonasal region whenever the trauma patient comes to us i will write it in a paper what are all this patient has got this problem how we are going to solve likewise this patient has got compromised airway this patient has got compound comminuted fractures he has got bilateral leaf root 3 with mid palatal split right orbital blow out fracture left parasympathetic fracture and right angle fracture how we are going to deal with this patient how to sequence this patient we have put the patient under nasal intubation we have a fibro optic scope in our hospital most of the pulmonologist will have adult scope adult scope it cannot be used for our purpose because adult scope only the et tube size more than 8 only we can put 8 or 8.5 but we need a pediatric scope for nasal intubation because most of the time occlusion plays the important role for facial bone fixation we have taken up the patient under nasal intubation we have operated a left parasympathetic fracture right angle fracture we have used transbuccal approach uh, right leaf root 3 fracture we have used intraoral approach for zygomatic maxillary subciliary for the orbital right orbital floor lateral bro for frontozygomatic region right orbital floor has been reconstructed with preformed striker orbital floor mesh this is the displacement of fracture on the right side this is after the reduction always you do the fracture with the intermaxillary fixation intact this is the orbital floor reconstruction using striker preformed mesh we have taken subciliary approach this is the immediate post operative picture for this patient this is the picture taken after 2 months you can see the occlusion by taking post op 3d ct you can assess your work like the displacement of fracture how you reduced this also we can use it for patient education this is how we have come this is how we have operated this is another view of uh, mid face fracture the orbital floor is been reconstructed with the cycle orbital floor mesh this is the sagittal section of the airway on the right side you can see the almost complete blockage of the airway due to tongue fall in the posterior aspect this is the post operative sagittal section the clearance of the airway due to fixation of the facial bones this is sag airway pneumogram you can compare the right side to the left side left side shows the complete release of airway by doing facial bone fixation this slide shows the sagittal section of the orbital floor reconstruction you can see the striker orbital mesh is just over the posterior ledge of the sphenoid bone this is the axial ct i usually take all the patients pre and post operative ct scan just to compare my work this axial ct shows how the lingual splaying is being corrected this is the dental window to check the placement of the implants right side is the one with the fracture and the displacement the left side this is after the fixation where you have placed your titanium plates and screws 
This is the pre and post operative picture of this patient. By taking this patient, you should take a few points like when it comes to airway management, simple interdental wiring in the emergency room can help to come out with the airway obstruction. You can put the patient on lateral prone position or sometimes you can use nasopharyngeal airway in case of midfacial fractures. Clinical and radiological evaluation, you should do clinically inspection, you should do palpation and auscultation. Auscultation, most of the time, we may be having the step while going the rounds, but we never use. The auscultation, it helps in whether there is post-traumatic subcutaneous emphysema is present or not, or you can check the vessels, neck vessels can be auscultated in case of high velocity fractures. You should read the CT in all three dimensions. Never go with the 3D CT to the theater for fixation. You should look for displaced tooth or any foreign bodies in all the sections, like either you should look at in sagittal section or axial section or coronal section. All these facial bone fractures, establishment of occlusion and intermaxillary fixation is mandatory. We may do by holding with our hand occlusion, then we can go for fixation. The final result, the patient postoperatively, there will not be any occlusion. All of us know, we know the other mode of correcting the occlusion, but that never should be. Either you do arch bar fixation or either you do IV loop wiring, you do proper occlusion, proper intermaxillary fixation, it will initially it may take 10 to 15 minutes extra, but it definitely save your time in fixation. Coming to the sequencing, I usually go from the mandible first, then establishment of the occlusion, then it, I go to the mid phase. The postoperative CT usually helps the axial CT, it helps in lingual splaying, how the lingual splaying is reduced or not. You can take a post-operative CT and you can visualize. Then it helps in patient education. By taking post-operative CT, I myself feel more confidence of taking more and more cases. Like This is like when you look at the post-operative CT, then you can assess your work. That is what I feel. I want to improve the case by case like Every case is a different case for me. Every case I want to do in a better way. I want to do better from this case to the next case, next case like that. We have a fantastic orbital floor implant for this particular patient. You have seen the orbital floor reconstruction. The striker preformed mesh, it helps. This is the another case. Uh, reported over emergency, history of fall. Uh, I think myself and Dr. Johan and we have operated this patient. This patient has got a CT scan with the diagnosis of bilateral condyle fracture and left mandible fracture. We have immediately taken up for this patient due to airway compromise. This patient has got intubation difficulty. We have used a pediatric scope for nasal intubation. This patient has got bilateral subcondylar fracture with the body fracture. You can very well appreciate the subcondylar fracture as well as the body fracture. Totally edangulous. Where is the guide for the fixation? This is another skull view of the body fracture and the anteromedial displacement of the, both the condyles. We usually go for the gunning splint and intermaxillary fixation. Nowadays, we open up the fracture site. We just go with internal fixation. The right side, the first slide shows preoperative 3D CT. The 
the, the middle one is uh, retromandibular transparotic approach. The third one is the postoperative CT with the reconstruction. This is on the left side. You can see it is also a subcondylar fracture. We have gone through retromandibular transparotic approach. You can very much appreciate it in the postoperative 3D CT. We have used Lynx titanium implants for this patient. This is the another, we have gone for the body fixation through intraoral approach. You can very much appreciate the displacement of the mandible on the body of the mandible. On the left side, you can see the fixation. This is the post-operative CT, the, both the condyle in the fossa. This patient has got coronoid fracture. We have not addressed the coronoid fracture. This is the preoperative picture. This is the postoperative picture. Whenever we do retromandibular transparotic approach, we should think of uh, injury to the mandib marginal mandibular nerve. Uh, this patient shows he doesn't have any neurological deficit postoperatively. Take home message from this patient. You should address the comorbid conditions due to the age. The patient may have, luckily, this patient doesn't have any concomitant uh, medical problems like uh, diabetic hypertensive. Uh, this patient has got atrophic mandible. We preferably, they, in, the, in case of atrophic mandible, we preferably go self-threading spurs. Uh, we do mini, minimal periosteal stripping. This open reduction in internal fixation result in immediate return to the function, avoids the need of intermaxillary fixations. Titanium fixation provides infection-free recovery. Definitely the patient will have psychological benefits. This is one interesting case. The mandible has got lingual splaying. One of the hospital from Mother Day, they asked me to operate by seeing this PA view skull. I insist on taking the CT. They're, they're telling like the patient is having GC 15 by 15. He has got on bilateral one small fracture is there. Why don't you go with the X-ray? Then also the hospital people will say the patient is very poor. He cannot affordable for CT. I said, no, 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 I, I need a preoperative CT for all my cases. By taking CT, you can see the displacement of the lingual cortex. It is almost going back and compromising the airway. This is the axial section CT. The mandible symphase has been shattered out into multiple pieces. By taking PA view skull, you cannot identify this lingual splaying and multiple commuted pieces. You cannot give better result to the patient. This is the 3D CT we have taken. You can see the magnitude of the displacement of the mandible posteriorly. This particular patient, we have put the patient under internal maxillary fixation. I want to reduce the lingual splaying. So we are just inside the theater. I have taken two long Hollis forceps without stripping much periosteum on the lingual aspect. I put, initially I, I just fixed with the buccal cortex with a small mini plates. Then I put this Hollis forceps, one beak on the lingual side, another one on the buccal side. I just compress the fragment. Then I just went with the fixation of 2.5 mm titanium sprues. This Hollis clamp definitely helps in fixing the lingual splaying. Most of the time, we neglect for the lingual splaying. This all reduction forceps are very big. That requires more periosteal stripping. I feel this. Uh, Hollis clamp definitely helps to for the reduction of the symphysis on the lingual aspect.
this is the immediate post operative picture of this patient this you can appreciate the fixation on the labial side pre and post ct now by seeing this skull base view how this hollis uh, forceps helps in reduction of the lingual fragments happens to the all fragments when it is shattered fractures now the mandibular fractures where it requires initial stabilization that means initial stabilization either we you do the interdental wiring or you put an arch bar as an emergency procedure that thereby it can result in further collapse of the symphysial segment which may result in airway compromise and aspiration this is the patient report to us with gcs 15 by 15 i have asked my fellow to do the arch bar wiring under local anesthesia this patient has got intraoral bleed continuously this patient has got sublingual hematoma and elevated tongue and elevated floor of the mouth and she has got compromised airway so i asked my fellow dr parth he has gone in the midnight he has put this arch bar under local anesthesia we have waited for this patient you can see the one second you can see the compound comminuted symphysial fracture total displacement on the lingual side the genial tubercle with the, all the muscle attachment of the tongue is been displaced this is the pre operative sagittal section airway there is complete occlusion of the nasopharyngeal airway this is another section axial and coronal section this is the this patient's cinematic rendering technology ct you can see the dental alveolar segment as well as the symphysial displacement this is another view right on the left side you can see on the multiple fragments on the lingual aspects also symphysial fragments has been displaced posteriorly okay coming to this particular patient when you should take up the case either you wait or you immediately you go in for surgery what are the choice of intubation we have for this patient and choice of fixation either you go for mini plates or recon plate approach either you do intraoral approach or extraoral approach the first question is when to operate uh, we have waited 48 hours we have put the patient under steroid let the tongue edema and the airway become secure we have taken up the patient after 48 hours the choice of intubation for this particular patient if the patient is unconscious or gcs is very low immediately you should go in for tracheostomy otherwise we may lose the patient either the patient will go for aspiration pneumonitis or airway obstruction we may lose the patient without doing electric tracheostomy but this patient has got gcs 15 by 15 we have waited we have asked the anesthetist to put on nasal intubation and we have proceed with the patient coming to the choice of fixation we have gone with the fixation with the 2.5 into 10 mm screws i usually prefer to go intraoral approach rather than extraoral approach extraoral approach sometimes in the midline region we may injure marginal mandibular nerve and also the fixation will be difficult i feel whenever you have this kind of mandibular the symphysis severe injuries you should look for a c spine luckily this patient doesn't have any c spine injury this is the initial stabilization done my fellow dr parth 
this is the intra operative picture see whenever you do when you have this kind of multiple dento alveolar segments while fixing the arch bar always fix the arch bar the imf in place never do a say open mouth procedure why i am telling is you may fix the arch bar with the open mouth position position with the result in collapse of the segments without putting the mandible to the maxilla in occlusion you tie the arch bar otherwise you may land up in the problem this is with the occlusion this is the intraoral fixation this is the immediate post op picture of this particular patient you can very much appreciate the reconstruction of the mandible symphysis right side is the pre operative left side is the post operative picture this is another occlusal the skull based view how the symphysical fragment is been displaced left side is the amount of reconstruction this is the post operative 3d ct this is an axial section this is for uh, my satisfaction whether uh, i have reduced the lingual fragments or not reasonably okay you can appreciate the pre op pictures right on the top the post op pictures axial section in the lower this is the post operative occlusion the way i am talking about uh, arch bar wiring arch bar wiring you should 100% you should do with the mandible maxilla in occlusion otherwise you may land up in the problem this is the pre and post op picture this is an pre and post op occlusion by seeing this patient you should take informed concern for airway infection you should inform regarding the post operative dental rehabilitation the initial stabilization is very much essential when you have this kind of symphysial fracture with the dental alveolar fractures intubation i i, uh, I initially i said you should ask for pediatric scope for nasal intubation occlusion is very much important for reduction then documentation of the patient records after of my presentation the final message for the post graduates and young surgeons the documentation of records i usually i personally document the clinical records and radiological records pre and post operatively i our hospital has a protocol for informed consent what is this informed consent we take audio visual recording with the blood relatives sometimes i will be explaining the emergency room with the patient relatives for minimum of 15 to 20 minutes one fellow the last will come after 20 minutes sir i am this fellow's father what is happening you have to tell me now so all these things you should avoid like you should talk only to the blood relatives then also one more thing we usually follow in our hospital the expenditure the how much this patient is going to spend approximately we write it in the case sheet with the signature who are all present in with the patient like this is the blood relatives either father mother or anyone we should write it over the case sheet like uh, this this patient has got this much fracture uh, this patient may require ventilated support the ventilated support which cost this much like that then also i take the patient concern for using the documents for educational purpose this quote yesterday dr ashoka said the most obvious thing you see may not be the most important thing be diligent examine every system this is one case we have operated uh, with the help of uh, dr sandeep and suresh they have come all the way from chennai for one navigation assisted uh, ramus condel replacement for one residual deformity at this juncture i would like to 
thank uh, Dr. Sindhil and uh, Dr. Suresh and my associate consultant, Dr. Nizar. These two are my fellows like uh, Dr. Gurkipal Singh and uh, Dr. Parth and Dr. Ram is a cardiothoracic anesthetist. I would like to thank the audience for patient listening. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, Dr. Chalpati, for this. Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Yeah, Chalpati? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful session. There's been uh, uh, appreciations on that. There are a few questions, Dr. Chalapati. Can I, can I ask yeah. you those questions? Yeah, please, ma'am. Yeah, so the questions range from assessment to uh, intervention. In yes, assessment, please. what they have asked is, what is the name of the software that you use to... Uh, Okay. Uh, assess the compromised airway. That is called uh, CT pneumogram. Uh, CT pneumogram. Uh, yes. We have the ACR's first uh, Siemens machine, go top. Okay, that cost around yeah. 4.5 crores. It has got yeah. around some 120 softwares exclusive for head and neck region. Okay. I just exploring this. Uh, yeah. It has got more softwares, but we can yes. use the softwares. Uh, it, it can help in uh, to rule out any compromised okay. so it is, CT neuro. Uh, yeah, it is uh, Siemens CT software. It has got CT pneumogram. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes okay. we can take it for OSA Thank cases you. also. You can use this uh, CT pneumogram. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes. So no, there's you. another there's another question on uh, you know the, the condylar fixation. I think uh, uh, as per evidence, they say that the minimum required is uh, two plate fixation, right? One along the lower uh, the posterior border and one along the sigmoid notch, right? So uh, yes, uh, do you have any do you have anything to say on that, sir? Ma'am, next week this condylar fracture will be extensively discussed by our senior faculties. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Understand. Yeah. Understand. We, we, Understand. Can, we can leave the this question is... for the yes. condylar panelist. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, they've also asked a question on the sequencing of uh, in edentulous fractures. No, if would you address the condyles? Yeah, would you I, address the condyles first or the no, body no, first? No, the body of the mandible first, then the right side. Then I look for which condyle is difficult first. Like yes, Then yes. I, I, we have uh, addressed the right side condyle. I think uh, the yes. canon will yes. be moving. Right yeah. side condyle, then the left side condyle we are operating. Uh, okay. so all we are thinking things, of so uh, marginal mandible now because yeah, we have done yeah. extensive, we have put a big incision for that uh, gentleman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, luckily, okay. we have not developed any neurological okay. deficits. Okay, sir. So, so it will be either symphysis, parasymphysis first and then the yeah. condyle. That's yes, what you say. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, is there any other alternative to gunning splint for IMF in edentulous patients, sir? Uh, Ma'am, I don't have any experience. This is the only <laughs> one case I have okay. operated throughout my okay. career. Okay, okay. CAD CAM uh, application for making splints to reduce the lingual splay? Can any? be used, madam. Yeah. One, uh, accuracy one, is better? Uh, yeah, one article I read with uh, Vanil has put one international journal. Yeah. She has made some uh, lingual splint kind of thing uh, which tied to the dental missing teeth which helps in uh, lingual, always it is very challenging, ma'am. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sometimes we come across with very good results. Otherwise, uh, occlusion will be very fine, but our uh, consciousness will say like, we would have done better for this patient. I also always take it in that way. Okay. I want so, to do better, better to the next, next yeah, patient. Yeah. Like. So, so what you're saying is the CAD CAM splint is good and the accuracy yeah, CAD -CAM is good to reduce, the, yeah, 100%, to, to, reduce the, to, to, to reduce the lingual split. To reduce the yes, lingual yes, yes, that's what we're talking about because you had a very good uh, you know reduction of the lingual uh, uh, cortical plate yes, in your last this, we uh, yeah, this that's inside the theater that, like i have just was, asked for the this thing they have brought one yeah, small yeah, alice clan when i asked yeah, for a bigger one that, yeah that's very nice sir and uh, there's a last question on uh, your last case you said your gcs was 15 by 15 but we see that there's a complete airway block uh, yes. How do you, uh, you know? The patient, you uh, we have put the patient uh, lateral prone position first. Then, uh -huh. uh, luckily, after putting the initial stabilization of the arch bar, the oral bleeding has much stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, lateral prone position, we have put the patient under steroid for two days. Mm -hmm. So GCS, you 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 yeah, you, uh, said, you you said the GCS score after doing the uh, primary management. Huh? 
trauma management no no madam on initial also gc is 15 the patient is fully conscious okay. but only thing is patient is not able to move the tongue forward okay because sir. the floor of the mouth as she has got lot of edema sir. right this uh, case i operated not in the bigger hospital like very small hospital i was just worrying i was not able okay. to sleep that night like if anything happens okay. tomorrow morning they will catch me like <laughs> okay okay so yeah so uh, the next question is how do you assess the lingual plate reduction intraoperatively sir is it by no. palpation or no no nothing can be done way? ma'am nothing can be you done just, you unless just... you have intraoperative ct inside your ot yeah that is possible otherwise uh, that also like when you want to strip more on the lingual periosteum which, which result in more damage to the more dam- muscular damage to the lingual bones like Okay. You do minimal manipulation with the better mm. results. Okay, right. And uh, what is the cinematic rendering? Can you can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Uh, this is like the recent uh, software. The Siemens people has come across to the world. Only Siemens has got neither this uh, G or Philips. They have got also the high end of machines. But this only the Siemens has got this cinematic rendering technology. i first initially asked my brother uh, what is this cinematic rendering technology he said like uh, when the the endron movie is taken no that the movie is taken by, by using this cinematic rendering software <laughs> okay okay so Then, so, so is it uh, some this is, uh, this is like a software man nothing else like this uh-huh. is the regular so, uh, so what is that is it something like this, you know that sub- subtraction angiogram dsa something like that or so uh, i mean wh- illa man this is a purely a software uh, so how do you what do you see what do you expect to see in a cinematic rendering uh, cinematic uh, rendering uh, see now uh, in our uh, scan center yeah we are able to identify the ligament attachment yeah that uh, medial and lateral can the ligament attachment by taking cinematic rendering technology okay uh, i will share a few pictures now later on okay, uh, with the how this uh, when you have lifo3 fractures how this uh, lateral can the ligament is whether it is attached to the bone or it is been displaced that one thing this is a very new software recently introduced a year before Yeah, we are working on it. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes sir. Yes, and sir. sublingual sublingual hematoma, I think uh, we would just uh, evacuate it, right? If there is a uh, sublingual hematoma, uh, intro, how would you do I, it? I, and when I would have... you when would you evacuate? When mm, would you evacuate? Mm, ma'am, IND can be done for this kind of uh, this thing. You can put oh. it dry. Okay. Uh, but so far, I have ever tried this technique, ma'am. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No problem. I think sublingual hematoma can be evacuated. That's it. Yeah, uh, yes, but uh, 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 you know, uh, they, there's also one more question. One last question yes, on uh, uh, submental intubation. Uh, would you consider submental intubation when yeah, you have, we have done the four three of, and a mandible? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Lot of yeah I think that's a, that's done, a good option. Yeah, yeah. submental intubation. Regarding submental intubation, also I want to say an important point. I think the there's a presentation the tube, of that also. Yeah, yeah, there is a position of the tube you should look in for. Correct. Ah, uh, then also one more very much important thing is when the GCS is low. Whenever whatever the facial bone fracture, when GCS is low, like um, whether the patient is maybe having a chest injury or intracranial injuries, the GCS is low as like seven or eight. better do elective tracheostomy and proceed the case don't operate the case with the nasal intubation or wait for another two days the lung will go become bad and you go for tracheostomy we yes. usually prefer to go for elective tracheostomy for bad lung the patient may go in for patient may have a uh, lower lobe aspiration or the patient may go in for ards you do elective tracheostomy tracheostomy yes. not only helps in the airway but pulmonary toileting is very much important this kind yes. of sick patients yes yes thank you so much uh, dr thank chalpati you. that's been yeah. wonderful thank you very much we'll thank go on to yes. the next speaker thank you thank you. thank you yeah thank, thank you so much ma'am thank, thank you so you. much please thank ma'am. you please. i think i think you need yeah. to yeah. take off your screen share so the next person can mm-hmm. share this how to stop screen share okay. just to thank stop you. sharing yeah thank yeah. you so yeah. much thank dr jimson Yeah, the next person, Dr. Sendal. How much time will it take? More than one hour will take, ma'am. Sorry. Wonderful presentation, sir.
Dr. Sendhil, you are doing next? Or? You have to unmute your mic. Sir, unmute yourself. Sir. Hello? Yeah, you, you can start your screen share. Is it shared? Able to see Dr. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, good afternoon to yeah, everyone. Yeah, my topic on some different type of pattern of mandibular fractures. I think most of you, you know that mandibular fracture starts very simple, like a hairline fracture, or it might go to the extreme, like a Communicated fractures. So, I show some of few of the cases what we have operated. Yeah, this is a very interesting case. So, where you can see the uh, complete center segment is fractured and displaced. This 3D CT shows the bilateral parasymphysis fracture, an unfavorable fracture, which along with the dendroalveolar fracture and the maxilla and mandible. When you see this type of fracture, you have to keep it in the mind because of avulsion of the tooth, there may be chances for some kind of aspiration or broken tooth structure, which is in the vestibule or in the floor of the mouth. That has to be taken care of. The other skull based 3D image, you can see that the amount of displacement of the mid segment completely more than a 1 to 1.5 centimeter completely displaced. So, the other 3D image which shows the displacement of and lingual splaying of the central segment. These type of the fracture, we have to keep it in the mind about the, as Dr. Imaginary says, sublingual hematoma and and for Most of the time, this much of displacement, which causes the airway obstruction. So this is the clinical picture which is, I think, a displaced fragment. It's more than a 1.5 centimeter with the youth, with the help of the bone plan. Or sometimes we can use the travel clip to bring back the segment to the normal anatomical position. So whenever we fix the segment, we have to make sure that we are in the proper uh, occlusion and bring the segment, fractured segment, most anatomical position. Once it is reduced properly in the three dimensional, that is in the labial, and you can elevate the periosteum and see the lowermost part of the mandible, just check the alignment intraoperatively. And sometimes we can strip off the little bit of lingual periosteum from the lower end and check whether it's properly uh, uh, merged with the adjacent. So most of these type of the cases, when we do that, usually proximal segment, there will be the uh, complete uh, uh, angle only. So we have to give the good compression on bilateral gonial angle, give the compression and get the, both the proximal segment get together and bring back the central segment and make the proper either the, uh, here for this patient, we have the long, uh, or synthesis uh, mandibular mini plate. Another one more interesting uh, kind of pattern of uh, mandible fracture is just symphysis 
kind of lower border community fracture along with the uh, uh, right side condyle and coronoid fracture. So whenever there is a force or impact, it's a high velocity injury, then there is a chances for uh, including the mm, maxillofacial unit or the craniofacial unit fractures. So here you can appreciate the fracture in the mm, fracture in the left parasophysis and uh, right side condyle and corona. This axial section you can see the uh, the amount of displacement. So also axial section is the one you can make sure that how much the displacement of each cortex. And you can easily uh, uh, make out that how much the uh, uh, protection is required and you can check the lingual screen and then if you take the CT contrast you can see the, uh, 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 the muscle pull also which is causing the and displacement of the fracture. This is the post-op OPG where we have reduced the fracture. The first one we have the uh, left parasymphysis, then followed by uh, uh, reduction of the right side content. And, 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 and sometimes, uh, if you are able to access and if required, if the coronary is displaced much, so we can treat the coronary also. Uh, this is the post op occlusion. You can see appreciate uh, good occlusion on the uh, left side. And this is the post-op score uh, where we have used the TMAP approach. Uh, this is an anterior parotid transmesitric approach. So there is a very uh, uh, the same approach we are able to uh, plate or fix both the condyle and the corona for this patient. Then another one more uh, uh, interesting type of fracture. Uh, this patient, uh, almost 28 year old, in, in the uh, history of high velocity injury, which made the fracture in the upper one third middle and the lower uh, one third. It's like a foggy bone fracture. Foggy bone fracture, which is running from the right side, uh, follows the gematic suture to the left supraorbital ring. And there is a uh, only the nasal cartilage uh, injury, not much of the nasal bone and the mandible fracture. Whenever there is the symphysis or midline fracture, you can see the uh, 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 bigonial width has increased. So always we have to keep it in the mind. Whenever uh, there is a uh, uh, bigonial width has increased, whenever we do the reduction, give the pressure on either side of the uh, angle, make it compress, then we will get the proper reduction. This is the uh, axial section where you can appreciate the amount of displacement and the uh, uh, required amount of um, reduction also. For this patient, uh, we need to operate on the mid phase and the upper phase and the mandible. So there is a no other option. Uh, either we can go for uh, nasal intubation, do the uh, uh, mandibular maxillary fixation. Then we have to change the tube to the oral. Then we have to go for the uh, nasal bone and the frontal bone fixation. Instead of that, we can go for the submental intubation. Here, a uh, small stab incision given and the uh, 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 end tube is passed through the submental region and fixed. Sometimes if it's a panfacial or huge edema, either we can opt for the tracheostomy. So this uh, of after the anesthesia, we can extubate. So we prefer for the submental intubation. This is the uh, upper one third of the face where the displaced, minimal displacement of the frontal bone is reduced and fixation is done with the uh, uh, mini plates. And this is the mainly the nasal cartilage across the nasal bridge. And uh, this is the uh, management done with the submental intubation without interfering with any of the facing. The symphysis of mandible is fixed. So you can appreciate the proper reduction for whenever we do the symphysis fracture or when you think that it's a bigonian uh, with this increased, always keep it in the mind that you have to give the uh, 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 pressure on either side of the angle region and make the occlusion proper 
then start fixing the mandible. Then other interesting case, there's a leaf foot, one fracture along with the mandible and bilateral condyle fracture. So here you can see the mid palatal speed. The condyle, you can see the right side and left is the completely medially displaced condyle. In the axial section, you can see that the, there is a displacement in the uh, symphysis region. This is a post-op fixation OPG where you can appreciate the two plates is done on the left side of the uh, condyle and the symphysis we have done with the um, mini plates. So either arch bar or eyelids before fixation giving the proper intermaxillary fixation is uh, very, very important to get the proper reduction. The another one more interesting case is it's a community fracture on the left side of the uh, body of multiple where you can see the uh, uh, community fracture in the region of second premolar, first premolar and the second premolar region. And the right side angle fracture. This is the skull base view. You can see the lingual splaying and the uh, uh, other segment, lingual segment, and the buccal side segment, and the angle also, the, uh, the uh, right angle angle is increased. So these type of the cases, whenever we do the reduction, there is a challenge. So we have to make it, uh, if the dendolveolar component is not much disturbed, uh, then we can do the proper intermaxillary fixation Make the occlusion pots stable and fixed. Then start fixing the only the thing is lingual spraying. We have to keep it in the mind, as Dr. Vengdachalapati said. So reducing the lingual cortex, most it's like a, a sagittal split or the uh, complete oblique split of the uh, mandible starts from the symphysis region, but it goes up to the first molar region. This type of the patient, when you examine, if you go and see on the lingual side, most of the time lingual mucosa is stabbed. Or sometimes the people or the patient feel the bone on the lingual side. So after reduction also, we have to plan for the most anatomical reduction. After reduction also, we have to, once you release the IMF, check on the lingual cortex, whether you are properly reduced. And um, uh, if possible, uh, three-dimensional reduction and in the lower border try to go lingually and just give a push on the lingual cortex and uh, plate it on the, uh, on the buccal side. The other one more interesting case, uh, this lady, Nigerian lady, we operated, she, she reported to us after 10 days of gunshot injury. She has the, uh, there are two uh, bullets one was through the mantle, the other one through the shoulder and the chest, just below the clavicle. Uh, uh, when we have seen the CT scan, this is a completely through and through, and it's complete shattered mantle on the left side. You can see the pellets uh, of the bullets it's just traveling in the floor of the mouth and hitting the opposite side, that is on the right side of the lingual cortex and makes the uh, opposite side also a kind of community fracture. You can see the bullet ball comes from the left side. Completely there is a more than 1.5 to 2 centimeter of bone defect. It was just beneath the, uh, uh, in the floor of the mouth and, and travel across the floor and hit the opposite side cortex and made, made the um, community fracture on the right side. So whenever we treat or deal these type of the cases, uh, uh, we have to keep it in the mind that because he reported after 10 days and we don't do the primary grafting on the, on the initial stage. We have done the proper uh, uh, wound debridement and just we, we make sure that uh, get the proper occlusion mm -hmm. because the central segment doesn't have the proper control because of on both the side, it got completely 
in, in different way from the rest of the proximal segment. So we made the occlusion and on the right side we are able to properly uh, do the uh, uh, load bearing plate or the recon plate then after that uh, our left side also we have done. The only reason we didn't do the primary uh, grafting because of expected the infection. The other more, other one more interesting case, the panfacial fracture. Uh, you can see the complete the uh, uh, face and the uh, uh, mandible and endovolvular component uh, and maxilla also it's completely uh, completely shut down. So so uh, so what is I want to show this patient because the complete maxillary dentition is gone. Only except the uh, left side posterior, the rest of the teeth already avulsed and only the uh, pieces of bones here and there in the maxilla also. And there was a mid palatal split. So this patient uh, had a low GCS. He was in ICU for some period of time. Uh, even uh, we didn't get the fitness for the for operating him. After the uh, airway uh, secured by the tracheostomy, and then we have taken up the cases after seven days. Uh, 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 this this coronal section, you can see the complete. Uh, uh, hemos sinus on both the max, uh, both the maxillary sinus and the nasal bone and palate all are shattered and mandible also there was a fracture in the middle uh, and this is to control the bleed in the pre-op stage uh, when uh, we have given us some kind of nasal pack and to get the uh, um, stop the bleeding followed by this is the pre-op picture and, and this is the post op. So, with this, I complete uh, my presentation. Uh, what I want to uh, give a take home message. So, always keep it in the mind or remember that whenever, whatever the velocity of the force, either the low velocity or high velocity, that we have to decide based on the amount of injury and the amount of force. If the, uh, you can make out based on the laceration on the face or the chin or uh, where the first point of contact or the, where the first point of the contact. That gives somehow the idea of uh, how the force is directed. If only in the chin point, we go to the either side angle or the usually bilateral condyle or the unilateral condyle fractures. If it's a low velocity fracture, there might be the uh, less amount of displacement. So, so the, the fixation plan and sequencing of uh, treating the patients also in can plan accordingly. If it's a high velocity injury, you have to see the amount of injury happen, and based on that, you have to sequence the uh, treatment plan. If in a single fracture in the mandible, always check, always check for the another uh, another fracture. Most of the time, thin hairline fracture in the surface is so so, uh, uh, but there will be the hairline fracture on the condyle or angle. So always if it's a single fracture in mandible, check for the second fracture. Whether nowadays we have the uh, CT scan, the gold standard is the CT. And if you run through the axial sections, you can make out any fracture on the either uh, buccal or the lingual cortex. The other foremost point is occlusion. For either maximum mandibular fixation, occlusion is the key. Always make sure that uh, uh, the intermaxillary fixation either by the uh, eyelids or the erics arch bar. Most of the time when we deal with the multiple fracture in the mandible, so arch bar will be the better to get the uh, uh, immobilization later. So uh, choosing the either load bearing or load sharing based on the amount of uh, injury and the comminuted fracture or non comminuted you can decide on the either the load bearing or the, these, all these points we have to take, keep it in the mind and we treat the uh, uh, very uh, different type or different pattern of mandibular fracture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sendhil, for that wonderful presentation. Yeah, thank uh, you, thank you you've shown us some, yeah, you've shown, shown us I, some fantastic cases. Uh, 
it was a feast to the eyes though though it is not something that should happen to anyone uh, no no questions actually not uh, just one question dr sendil yes, i think uh, with your presentation and with dr venkata chelapati's presentation everyone's clear on uh, mandibular fractures uh, one thing everyone's understood is mandibular fractures many a times do not uh, happen alone they happen with many other uh, bone facial bone fractures too and yes, uh, so one the question that is there sir is um, for gunshot injuries uh, yes, would you approach intraoral or extraoral uh, no ma'am this all done extraorally yeah 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 it's okay. more That's community and yeah. yeah we don't want to yeah. compromise yeah. on the blood supply yeah. so it's already kind of more than 10 days exactly more. exactly so yeah so we extended so, the submandibular incision bilaterally and uh -huh. it's both the uh, pre conflict so so the more broken bones the mandible is the extraoral approach is more uh, um better than an intraoral approach isn't that so yes yes ma'am yeah 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 so before we go on with the next uh, speaker dr um, uh, dr sendil uh, when we have a symphyseal fracture with uh, or a parasymphyseal fracture with bilateral angle fracture yes, uh which is the fracture that we would uh, we would uh, fix first and how do we maintain that bigonial width that's okay. something that the post graduates always uh, wonder yeah, yeah, always yes because we always say you go from the dentate get the occlusion yeah. then okay. go to the non dentate that is our principle right yes, but you know when you have a situation like that where you have a you know some angle fracture yeah, yes, exactly with yeah. a symphysis or parasymphysis okay. fracture yeah. how would no, you always i prefer the same way ma'am dentate first uh, we try to get the as much as whatever the dentate possible get the proper occlusion okay and once we get the proper occlusion either reduce symphysis or parasymphysis okay. then i go to the uh, angle okay okay Based so you don't have a you don't you, you you don't have a problem with splaying of the you know in yeah, yeah, we cycle. always used to have the splaying no? we have oh. to uh, 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 instruct our uh, supporting assistants. staff or our assistant yeah that's the proper bigonial very... yeah compression yeah the assistants and, yeah, are very yeah. very important yeah, yeah. Yes. thank you so much yeah. dr sendil i think with that yeah. our question session is over yeah. uh, if you could sh uh, you know stop sharing the screen uh, we could have the next yes, speaker on uh, i would like to uh, thank eva uh, masaiman especially for rina ma'am and dr jimson and i would like to thank all the participants who yeah. patiently listen our Thank you, so Thank, you Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So we have next we have Dr. Ashok uh, Ramdurai. He is going to speak on uh, the complications that uh, that form a challenge in uh, managing mandibular fractures. Dr. Ashok Ramdurai. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can yes, hear you. We can hear you. And, yes. Uh, Thank you. Can you Good see morning. my name over there? Yes, we 100%. can. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. So yeah. Okay. Uh ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, a very warm welcome to you. Uh Professor Jimson, Dr. Reena, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts and uh, share a few cases uh which I have uh, encountered challenge uh, along with my team over the last couple of decades. uh a special warm welcome to my post graduates from taimukami dental college and uh, a warm welcome to my esteemed colleague vandana professor pradeep head of the department and uh, dr srivatsa okay before we delay let's get started we have uh, several challenges which we can encounter in a mandible fracture you know uh this presentation is primarily for the post graduates uh uh i've kept in mind the, the cohort of students being the exam going pgs because it will it will help them with the upcoming exam uh hello can you hear me uh so uh, yeah done okay so we have several challenges uh, ranging from infection delayed union non union occlusal disturbances uh, nerve disturbances and deformity definition uh, i think the post graduates uh, can note what is a non union a fracture which is failed or which is not united 8 weeks of your orif and requires definitive surgery it requires definitive reexploration 
rigid fixation plus or minus a bone graft is considered a non-union fracture. And what is a delayed union? A fracture which is not healed eight weeks after fixation, but it can be salvaged with minimal intervention conservatively or in increasing the duration of fixation. There is a little bit of an overlap, but the primary thing for a non-union is you need a definitive surgery. Interestingly, for non-union, the incidence has not changed over the last two decades. And this has been published by Mathog. The incidence range is uh, between 2.8 to 3.9%. It's quite interesting that regardless of the advancement in fixation techniques and reduction, the in incidence of non-union is still in the same range. What are the causes? Inadequate stabilization or reduction. Uh, the ones I have marked in red are the ones I have clinical photographs to share with. And infection or osteomyelitis is certainly a risk factor, a contributory factor. Failure to provide post-operative antibiotics is debatable. A uh, lot of surgeons feel that post-operative antibiotics does not have an, uh, a negative impact or a negative uh, outcome. Delay in treatment is certainly a risk factor. It was found that a delay of 72 hours or so uh, did not actually increase the risk of non-union. However, uh, Morenko et al. in the JOMS have published that any delay in a week or two weeks after trauma certainly increases the risk of, risk of post-operative infection. Tooth, root, or teeth in the line of fracture is certainly a risk factor. And you have patient factors, which is alcohol abuse, which is very, very common these days, and drug abuse. And we also have surgeon's factor, which is inexperience, inadequate training, lack of knowledge. And a lot of other specialties also uh, do maxillofacial surgery. And uh, you can see in a couple of slides about the mismanagement. And lack of patient compliance is also another cause. Am I okay, audible? Yes, 100%. It's quite interesting to note that the most common site of the mandible is actually the body. Mandibular body is the most common site published for non-union and has been attributed to a lot of mucoperiosteal stripping during surgery and impaired blood supply and additional difficulties in establishing or correcting occlusion. Now, this is a patient who actually presented to me in Savita Medical College two, two and a half years back. He was a, a hearing impaired, deaf and mute, uh, disabled patient. And the history was he actually tripped and fell over a pipe and smashed his face. And he had a small existing laceration. So you can see multiple bits, comminution of the mandible. And that is one case where you can expect problems of non-union, delayed union and sequestrum. So what did we do? We went through the existing incision submandibular and fixed it with a striker reconstruction plate. And uh, intraoral, we also fixed his mandible and the condyle. What was interesting and what was challenging was the patient kept coming back several days and several weeks with pain in the submandibular area, in duration because of multiple bits of bones which we may have missed and uh, I do not have a post-operative review fixture after this because I changed my job. It's important from postgraduate training point of view to note down the patient factors. So these cohort of patients have a higher incidence of non-union, a higher incidence of post-operative infection. Any patients with a history of immunosuppression polysubstance abuse, intravenous drug abusers, HIV positive individuals, and uncontrolled diabetes. And it's been published in the journal, the reference I've given to. I mean, postgraduates can now, it, it may be quite useful to actually go through this article. You can save this on your screen. It's been published that pre-existing infection or osteomyelitis which develops after fixation is certainly a risk factor. 
and this basically causes reduced oxygenation and proliferation of fibroblasts and decreased osteoblastic activity so it ends up with more of a fibrous rather than a bony union now this is an example of a surgeon's factor now several years back about maybe 12 or 13 years back when i was working in savita dental college we had this patient who presented from the east of india somewhere in assam meghalaya he came all the way they referred to i think professor beg with uh, signs of uh, infection and non union i presume that this patient was treated by a non maxillofacial specialist i mean intraosseous wiring was an accepted standard of care in the days of the old but certainly not today with the advent of uh, rigid fixation mini plates uh, this is not considered an acceptable standard of care today and uh, for obvious reasons of poor fixation and poor stability following fixation the patient presented with infection so we had to actually go in and remove the intraosseous wire and do in a proper fixation and also remove the infected root stump which was missed by the non maxillofacial specialist understandable so this picture i'm just trying to reiterate the point that surgeon's factor also influence the post operative problems especially infection and non union now this is quite interesting from post graduate exam point of view to note down alcohol abuse is fairly rampant in our society especially in the west and also in india it's been published that over 15.5% of the patients developed post operative infection and problems and what happens in alcohol abuse decreased osteocalcin levels now this is a pr protein secreted by your osteoblasts and osteocalcin is also a biochemical marker for bone formation and there is also histological evidence of decreased bone formation and ethanol alcohol has direct effect direct toxic effect on the osteoblastic activity proliferation and bone homeostasis therefore any person with a history of chronic alcoholism and alcohol abuse you can expect them to run into problems and they certainly have a negative effect or impact on fracture healing and bone metabolism there was this landmark paper by ed ellis and edward ellis said this risk of alcohol or chronic alcoholism and the problem and the negative impact associated with this factor can be eliminated with rigid fixation ed ellis confirmed that if you get a patient with a history of chronic alcoholism say with an angle fracture or a displaced fracture he said go and fix it with a reconstruction plate a, a load bearing osteosynthesis he said by doing that you can virtually eliminate the risk factor and he has published it in jomsi as early as 1993 i'll go to the next slide just giving a bit more time for post graduates if they wish to note down substance abuse certainly has a negative impact on healing the patient patients with drug abuse obviously have lack of oral hygiene poor self esteem poor self care malnourishment vitamin deficiency and lack of compliance and a lot a small cohort or a large cohort of patients who have drug abuse are hiv positive uh, individuals so there is a high overlap so patients with hiv positive infection have obviously a high incidence of infection it's quite important to assess they see their cd4 counts as an assessment marker prior to surgery is also important in fact is more important to recognize opportunistic infections in these individuals if you have a hiv patient with a displaced fractured mandible he already shows uh signs of opportunistic infections then that is definitely a higher altered risk of post operative infection it's been published that over 22% in their study had post operative infection in intravenous drug abusers so this lethal cocktail of hiv positive 
poly substance abuse drug abuse and alcohol have a negative impact on your treatment outcomes a little more literature on drug abuse well it's all starts with smoking smoking certainly affects your end tissue perfusion causes a lot of microvascular angiopathy and compromise for some unknown reasons it does affect cellular and humoral immunity it certainly retards bone healing and adver adversely affects bone mineral density and obviously increases the risk of osteomyelitis this is very important for post graduates to note down and the common drug cocaine itself is a powerful vasoconstrictor and the last thing you want is vasoconstriction on a healing wound has a negative effect on the perfusion vascularity and therefore the outcome it's important to recognize that drug abusers have personality issues psychiatric problems nourishment issues and therefore will run into problems of post operative infection delayed union and possibly non union i'm going to share a case with you of a patient who presented to us in singapore with a displaced angle fracture uh the only contributory medical history he was somewhere in the mid 40s uh the only contributory medical history was history of drug abuse he was actually a prisoner involved in a scuffle was punched several times on the face ended up with a displaced fracture uh before i started this job in singapore my colleague uh, you know used uh load sharing osteosynthesis with shompi's principles two plates and fixed it adequately and i had to follow up the patient and the patient presented for several weeks with recurrent pain and signs of infection purulent discharge and this is what the post operative ct suggested now what's happened is there has been post operative infection because of the several reasons i have already been through because of drug abuse and that infection has actually eaten up the healing bone you can see the in the loss of bone the bone loss and a defect actually now this could have been prevented had we listened to ed ellis's paper and simply put in a 2.3 unilock system reconstruction plate and we could have simply got away without this uh, problem uh intraoral you know conventional fixation based on shompi's principle did not work for this patient because of the risk factor of drug abuse so he presented it to us and what did we do so just to reiterate what was done for the patient so we went in with the submandibular incision removed the hardware and then we found a nice defect which we expected in the ct scan and you can see all the healing bone being eaten up and he actually has a defect so we actually did an anterior iliac crest bone graft took a nice chuck of uh, chuck a block of bone and fixed it with a reconstruction plate that's his post operative occlusion and post operative imaging so we did do custom made arch bars and uh, because they were available and we got a reasonably good occlusion satisfactory occlusion and the patient was sent back to prison un with uneven and healed uneventfully the second risk factor am i audible just double checking yes. yeah 100% the second risk factor uh, is tooth or missed roots uh, in the line of fracture it's especially missed by other disciplines other than maxillofacial surgery because they are not used to doing opgs any root or teeth or teeth fragments can be a portal of infection especially if they are mobile and if they got peri or periapical issues thaler in his journal has published an incidence of at least 30% post operative complication and in infection because by leaving a tooth in line of fracture so if you have an infected tooth or a mobile tooth with perio or periapical pathology there is a one in three chance that you will have to do in you know, go in inside go in and fix it with a second surgery 
Now, this was again a missed uh, root, you know, infected root stump. It was uh, done by a surgeon of another discipline. And, uh, you know, this is a surgeon's factor. He just went in and fixed it with a plate. And the patient, you can see that, presented to, to us with non signs of non-union and post-operative infection. So what went wrong in this? Certainly poor fixation by another discipline. This was compounded by a missed infected root in the fracture site, which was obviously failed to diagnose because they did not do an OPG. And lack of experience and technical expertise, being a non-maxillofacial surgeon, contributed to all surgeons' risk in creating a non-union. You can see that. There's a nice big defect. Immediate post-operative pictures will actually look nice, but what happens is because of the poor fixation and instability and infection, that infection actually eats away all the bone and resorbs all the bone, and you can end up with a nice defect over here. So what we did was to go in, remove the implant, remove the uh, tooth, and that's what's a defect. So we did an anterior iliac crest bone graft. Now this is just from postgraduate teaching point of view. You can see the inguinal ligament there, the anterior iliac crest, the ASIS, the tuberculum impar, and you must be watchful at least of these three nerves, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the subcostal and the iliohypogastric nerve. It has been published that there is a 2.5% incidence of lateral femoral cutaneous nerve injury, and it can lead to a condition of persistent dysesthesia and paresthesia in the lateral tie, and it's called meralgia parasthetica. So you, you need to be watchful in handling the tissues to avoid these three nerves. And we usually go in for a medial dissection because a lateral dissection, you usually strip the tensor fascia lata, although it may be easier, the patient ends up with gait problems. So simple skin, subcutaneous tissue, incise the scarpa fascia and identify the medial tissue. We have nice large cobra retractors, which we use. And we usually use a uh, saw and uh, sometimes a micromotor to complete the osteotomy. A uh, pterygoid chisel is actually quite useful in completing the osteotomy to get a big chunk of bone, which we use to fix the defect. That's a nice ch chunk of bone from the anterior iliac crust. Now that was beautifully used in the defect. We've trimmed it and then done a direct fixation using a reconstruction plate, which is the standard of care in a non-union fracture with a defect. So it is extremely important to use a load bearing osteosynthesis. Professor Sendal Nathan was reiterating on the choice of plates in his last slide. That is very, very important to choose the right implant is very important to note your, know your implant system before you choose it. Load-bearing osteosynthesis, uh, you know, assumes 100% of the functional load and a locking plate is obviously helpful and comminuted fracture, which I showed previously, or a non-union with a defect fracture, the obvious choice is a load-bearing osteosynthesis. That's from the AO slide. This is another patient of mine who had a pathological fracture primarily because of patient, lack of patient compliance. Now this patient presented in our outpatient in Singapore with a cystic lesion in the mandible, biopsy proved an odontogenic keratocyst. We went in, excised the tooth, enucleated the cyst, did a carnoy according to Prof. Tidemann's uh, protocol and put in a bit pack and uh, you know, looked at the patient, followed up the patient for several weeks for secondary intention. And what did we get after several months was a pathological fracture with a minimal defect. So these things can happen. It's very, very important to educate your patient about, about the diet. You think you've done a wonderful job and six months later, you end up with a pathological fracture. And the answer is a load bearing osteosynthesis. We went in, explored it. The defect was not too bad. So we did not go in for a bone graft, although the patient was consented for an anterior iliac crest bone graft. So you use a reconstruction plate, load-bearing osteosynthesis. As you can see, 
three locking screws on each side of the fracture. And that was an adequate fixation, reasonably occlusion, the patient went back happy. That's just a post-op CBCT, which was done in our dental clinic in our follow-up sessions. Summary of my presentation, non-union or you know, uh, non-union of fractured mandible. Uh, the treatment regime is individually tailored and it's definitely reconstructive surgery, meaning uh, you need to put in a reconstruction plate, plus or minus a bone graft. During any infection, like any other infection you just treated with, MCS, microbiology, culture, and sensitivity, intravenous antibiotics, empirical, and then you wait for your culture, liaise with your pharmacist and start the appropriate antibiotics. Drainage, which, you know, with a rubber, rubber drain or corrugated drain initially, prior to surgery, and wound debridement, you know, remove all the muck, and you need to stabilize your fracture with a rigid internal fixation, load-bearing osteosynthesis with a reconstruction plate. If the defect has developed, which it is likely to, you straight away and do a iliac bone graft, okay, which is my preferred choice where you can get lots of bone. Some surgeons prefer parietal bone or even the mandible. And the take-home message is when you have a cohort of patients like alcohol abuse, drug abuse, or HIV positive individuals, uh, be a bit more aggressive, try and avoid second surgery by using a reconstruction plate following Ed Ellis's paper in 1993. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramadare. That was a fantastic presentation. Fantastic presentation on uh, uh, complications and how to manage it. Uh, beautiful thank cases. You. Yeah, just one question, Dr. Ramdure. Um, I'm glad it's only one question. Uh, yeah, the, uh, how do you radiographically differentiate between uh, delayed union and non-union? How do you differentiate radiologically between delayed and non-union? Mobility, ma'am? Uh, uh, radiographically, I think you cannot differentiate, right? Uh, that, that's why no, I said in the definition, right. there is a yeah. bit of an overlap. There is yeah, a bit of an overlap. Yeah, yeah. What you keep delaying, and if it doesn't heal, it just becomes a non-union. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's a yeah. bit of a gray hair, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. Thank you so much for that. So we go Thank on with the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Deepanand, and he's going to speak on pediatric mandibular fractures, I think. Uh, Dr. Deepanand, shall we? Yes, yeah. So after all, uh, the invasive techniques, we'll be just looking into some unusual cases, which we have not done. And we have deal, dealt with the conservative cases. And before that, I'd just like to share some tip on bending of an angle plate or fracture. Is it visible? Yes. So normally, whenever we want to place a plate on angle, it's always a little difficult one because due to the curvature, which is getting into the public ridge. So the technique what we have been taught and a simple one is to just when both the plates rotate in opposite direction. Like, very simple, just rotate it in the opposite direction. So you get a very nice curvature which is duplicating the public ridge. There is exact fit. Only the direction of uh, the bending has to be adjusted according to what kind of curvature you have. Otherwise, it fits very perfect. Just an edited one, just to show the tip of the plate, what you can achieve by a very simple one.
to the last course. So the, the good bending always give a good reduction. That is the policy of doing it. And doing it is very simple, just bend it twice. That's it. Okay, thank you. So I'll just move to the usual cases. Some unusual cases which we have encountered, which we are unable to do invasive, sometimes which has been asked by neuro colleagues not to destabilize them from the bed or transfer to OT, just to do some mild conservative treatment. So this is a case which was referred from the neuro, neurology ward, uh, which patient had a left angle fracture with C1 fracture, C1 vertebral fracture. So they told that they don't want to shift the patient. And when we saw it, already the collarbone was placed for the patient. So, so he had a very limited mouth opening. So only this much of the mouth opening he could expect because of a rigid collar was fixed. Uh, so what we have thought of uh, what kind of uh, mobilization we can do. And then you can see the fractures, angle fracture has been defined here. It was not a uh, complete uh, displacement. It was a very less displacement case. So we thought, so we have to pull the occlusion also forward. Same time we have to reduce without uh, giving much of uh, pressure or traction to his neck. So then we went on to so this is the occlusion which was present right side. There was a proper occlusion. Left side, there was a deviation. There was no occlusion up the left side. So just we went through certain literatures, how, what all effective method we can use it to achieve without uh, turning his uh, head right or left. Then we concluded to have an elastics. So we used a big uh, brackets from the molars to premolar canine region and then uh, both sides, and then we made a box elastics, cross el box elastics, and then certain cross elastics to pull the angle forward. This was kept for, for four weeks time, and then his occlusion has improved after four weeks time, and there was a good stabilization of the fracture segment. So this was post-operative four weeks occlusion, after debonding the brackets. So the next case is a pediatric case. So it's all also operated long back. So we have a two-wheeler hit uh, where it's unable to bite. There was a displaced right mandible and swelling on the right side. So only lateral mandible views was obtained and it was diagnosed as parasympathesis fracture on the right side. So again, for this case also, we were uh, we are not able to operate because there was a lot of tooth bed erupting, we could see in the radiograph. So that we thought we'll go by conservative management where we can make a splint and then do a circumferential wiring of mandible. So the model was taken from the patient. You can see the model which is having a displacement of the premolar, sorry, molar region, in the molar region, the body of mandible. And then it was cut and osteotomy cut was done and pasted and then articulated. And we made a splint, acrylic splint for circumferential body. Taking the patient into OT using a mandibral awl. So normally the owl was introduced on the lingual aspect first. And then the wire was placed and then pulled along the periosteum to the other side, to the buccal side, and the wires were being tied. So here the splint also, we didn't involve the... Can you, yes. uh, there is some, uh, you, can, you, can you talk a little loud? Or yeah. Audio is not very... Very clean. Yeah. Actually, circumferential wires were introduced. Here, the splint, we didn't cover uh, the tooth because we thought we'll keep it for four weeks' time. 
Could you hear me? Yeah. No? Yes. Is it yeah, now, now it's clear. Let, yeah, let, it's yeah. more audible. Okay. So now the splint, we, we kept, this was an open splint because there were primary tooth uh, erupting. Uh, so we thought we don't want to disturb that. And so we kept it as an open splint. So same kind of uh, situation, we had it in other patient where uh, the, it's a five-year-old patient, again, a lot of multiple erupting buds within the tooth. So which has a symphysis and a left uh, condyle fracture patient. So here also uh, the same kind of technique where, but we had both upper and lower splints uh, made. Upper and lower splint made, and we didn't do a circumferential veining, but we did a splinting, uh, in, we did a splinting with cement. Same thing, uh, one thing what we added is, we added some hooks in the splint so that we can do an uh, elastics. So that was the case what, what we did for this kid. And the same time, we did a manipulation. We did a, a manipulation. We didn't go, uh, because there was not a big uh, defect in the zygum. We just tried to do a manipulation on the zygum region and try to elevate the thing on a closed reduction. We didn't op do a open. We did a op closed reduction for the zygoma where we have elevated the zygoma. So this was the displacement which was present. And a, clo a closed splintered uh, surgical guide was used to reduce the fracture. So this is the post-operative picture of the patient where we could see the good uh, uh, condyle healing as well as the symphysial healing of the patient. So this was done nearby 14, 15 years ago. So this is the final radiograph, which shows a good uh, lower border. So the main thing why we decided not to do is because you can see the bud, which is erupting, the central, lower central incisors, which were er erupting. So that only we thought of uh, doing a, <coughs> a splint, not to interfere with any surgical intervention. And you could see a nice good, uh, even the condyle healed after four weeks time of the splinting and maintaining the occlusion also. Maintaining the function, same time the function of the patient also was left. Only two weeks we had a intermaxillary fixation with elastics, and after that it was maintained with only the splints. So these are the some unusual cases what we have inquired in mandible fractures. So that will be ending my presentation. So the basic thing what I said is always retain your basis, whatever we study in the beginning, like history of uh, fracture, treatment of fracture. So we, if you retain the roots, I think we can apply somewhere when we are when in a difficult situation where we are unable to implement the uh, osteosynthesis principles. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity given to present. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deepan. That was nice, especially the video in, uh, in the beginning, no? where, where you showed the uh, talking of the plate that, for the angle fracture intraoral approach. That's very useful, very useful. Thank you so much. That shows the teacher in you. And uh, I think I wish I was a postgraduate. <laughs> Nobody ever taught us like this. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, it you. was a hard way to learn. Yeah. Yes, Thank yes. You. Thank you very much. Uh, there are no there are no questions. I think it's very clear. Or uh, We still have uh, more more than uh, you know 180 participants and uh, they are still stuck uh, you know uh, listening to all of you and uh, they yeah. seem to be benefited and uh, uh, there's no questions on the chat dr jimson is there any question that you have seen on the youtube link um, no, no questions in youtube as well no. yes thank you so much that was a very different presentation each one of you with very interesting cases speaking from experience is so different from speaking from your textbook knowledge and theoretical knowledge and that showed in this presentation <laughs> thank you very much dr jimson thank you, thank you. now i'll uh, share the uh, uh, link for the feedback I think there is a question on KOYA. <laughs> okay, did you see that? Yeah. Could you, could you just... It can be used for pediatric condylar fractures. Okay. Yeah. I yeah, think I missed that. Now, now, yeah, now we don't uh, do much of KOYA, but uh, still in circumstances, I think we can use KOYA. Okay. 
Okay, Dr. Deepal. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jimson. Ma'am, I think there was one question which was missed. There's some of them, one of them had asked, is it better to do intraoral or extraoral approach for uh, yeah. fractured mandible? I answered, yeah, I, I answered okay. it on the chat, but you can answer okay. if you want to add something, please. I mean, being maxillofacial surgeon, 100% intraoral is the choice, unless you're doing a reconstruction plate where you need to do extraoral approach, and that has got very, very specific indications. Right. Uh, never cut open the neck to fix an angle fracture on a healthy patient. Unless it's displaced badly and you have Absolutely multiple no. Unless we have very, very Unless specific. Unless you have a wound. Already you yeah. have a wound, better just use the wound. Yes. That, that's true. You have an existing laceration, that is the yes. choice. Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Dr. Jimson? Yes. Uh, I posted the... Uh, question in the chat box you can click on that uh, link and then give your feedback uh, i know that we have not sent the certificates as yet uh, you will receive the certificates for all the three sessions uh, within the next three days uh, separately yeah and uh, and then now i'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists uh, for having taken your time to prepare, do this preparation. I know how uh, hard you people have worked to get this presentation done uh, in the last few days. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Venkata Silapati, for sharing your experience, and uh, uh, Dr. Sentil, Dr. Ashok, and uh, Dr. Deepanand. It's a pleasure to have you on, this, on the program. And uh, looking forward to working closely with you uh, in the future as well. And uh, uh, thank you, ma'am, for the uh, wonderful moderation. Uh, thanks a lot, ma'am. And, and, and thanks, Jimson. Thank you. And, and uh, to remind all the participants, next Sunday, uh, same time, uh, we are having a panel on condyle fractures. And for the benefit of the postgraduates, tomorrow we are having the next session on Ask Your Mentor. Uh, on Wednesday and Friday, you have the final session on uh, Ask Your Mentor. So it, it, it is a, a miscellaneous session. So whatever questions have been left out, which are not answered before during the regular sessions will be taken up, as well as the session on malignancies, which was not uh, conducted uh, last week. And uh, uh, for, for, for the uh, information, uh, we are going to have this uh, Seminars, I mean the webinars uh, in July as well, the same time, 11 o'clock on all Sundays. And the topic is going to be orthognathic surgery. So we are in the process of uh, uh, in uh, planning the sessions. So my next Sunday, you will have the uh, program schedule uh, for the month of July. And for August, again, uh, we are planning for reconstruction. Uh, so every month we are planning to take up uh, one topic. Uh, so we have to, uh, I mean, because during this COVID times, that is a new normal. So let us engage ourselves uh, on Sundays. Uh, and I, I think this is a good time, 11 o'clock, not very early. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll finish up before lunch so that everybody can go and have a sumptuous uh, meal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Jim, sir. You brought uh, a new normal to the teaching also. <laughs> <laughs> you made us students. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Jimson. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, all. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, Mike, uh, Chandru, and Dufan, and the entire team of uh, Striker Eva. for supporting uh, our association, the Tamil Nadu State, uh, Tamil Nadu and Puducherry Branch. We really appreciate your support. Yes. Thank, thank you, Mike. Chandru. Thank mm -hmm. you, Chandru. Thank, thank you, you and Santil. Yeah, thank, and... You. thank you all, sir. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you all. See you on thank some you. other time. Bye. Yeah, hundred percent. Thank, thank you. <laughs> stay <laughs> safe. We'll be waiting. <laughs> yeah, stay safe. Hundred. <laughs> we'll do it. Come back soon. Yeah. Jimson, yeah. come back soon. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I am waiting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or they may give you the, the Australian citizenship for all you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bye.
Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you, Stryker. Thank you, Eva Masang. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Um, I think um, Lupran will have a few more minutes before I close the questionnaire, the feedback. Sure, sir. Gupan. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, I think there is a delay in uh, uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. So, if we end the session, will it stop uh, broadcasting in YouTube? Yes, sir. So, you need to wait for some time before you stop uh, live streaming, right? Yeah.
I think so. We have to leave now. One minute. Okay. Okay, we'll end, we'll end the session, yeah. Okay, bye-bye, sir. Bye, bye, thank you. Thank you, Bupan. Bye-bye. I'll make you a host and... Yes, sir. Perfect. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.